pleasure uh, to see you, dear Shema, and thank you for uh, agreeing to participate uh, in this series of conversations uh, we're hosting on behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy and for agreeing to share timely perspectives from the MENA region where the intersection of the power of youth and technology has a huge opportunity to enhance philanthropic practice uh, and resulting impact. Shema Al Sabah is um, herself a wonderfully successful example of this opportunity. Uh, Shema's calling to launch Give in 2019, I believe, came when she uh, could not find the tools and information that would enable her to effectively and transparently support uh, response efforts to uh, a large earthquake that struck uh, Iraq and uh, Iran. And determined to address this need, Shema enrolled in accelerator programs to gain the knowledge and support that she needed to pursue her specific goal of making online giving as easy and trusted as uh, perhaps online shopping. Uh, Give is now successfully channeling uh, large amounts of support and donations to address numerous urgent causes, not only in Kuwait, where of course Shema is from, uh, but also elsewhere in the MENA region, as well as uh, wider Asia and uh, Europe. Dear Shema, I'd like to begin with the story of Give. What is Give's ultimate vision? Um, how does it work? And what inspired you to uh, establish this platform and put so much of your time and energy behind it? First off, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to have this conversation with you. Um, so Give is um, a nonprofit company which aims to improve the process of donating and encourage charitable giving. We created an online platform which connects donors with registered Kuwaiti charities in order to provide more choice, convenience and transparency. Uh, users can donate on our app or website give.org.kw, I have to plug it. Um, and it's completely free for charities to join. 100% of the donation amount goes to charities. And we provide all of the charities with access to their own portal where they can add projects, add reports, uh, monitor donations with complete transparency. At the moment, we have 20 charities on board um, and over 190 Yes, 190 active projects, uh, both in Kuwait and internationally. Um, so how does it work? We believe that by utilizing technology in a very straightforward manner, we can do our part to bridge the gap between donors and, and charities. So if we look at donors, um, it used to be the case that if someone wanted to donate, they weren't really aware of what was available in terms of campaigns. We'd find out about new campaigns on social media, uh, like a sponsored ad or through word of mouth in our family, which is quite a haphazard way of donating. Um, the other thing is that if someone had a specific cause in mind, if they saw something on the news or they wanted to give to a specific country, they'd have to go to Google or browse to various websites until they found what they wanted. And this is you know, time consuming and inconvenient. And the longer that this process takes, the less likely the person is to donate. They'll just forget about it. Um, so a platform such as ours helps solve some of these problems. And it also serves to provide you with some added benefits. We've gathered all the campaigns in one place by various charities. So the donor has easier access to information. It's also easier to filter because we have a double filter by category or by country. So you can search if you have something specific in mind. Um, our main page on the website and the app is dynamic. It keeps changing. So whenever there's an emergency or a new, or a new, um, a new campaigns launched, we highlight them, we showcase them. And it also changes according to time of the year. So for example, during Ramadan, we'd focus on iftar and so on. So you could, you could browse or you could go and search for something specific. Um, the other wonderful thing about a platform is you can compare projects from different charities. And in that way, you can learn or find out about campaigns or charities you didn't even know about before. You know, I think older generations were much more loyal to a specific charity and only give to that, that charity. But I, we're finding with younger generations, Yes, the charity has to be credible, but it's the cause that speaks to them. It's how transparent the charity is with communicating, 
right? So a platform allows people to explore and find new, new campaigns. Um, obviously, content is very important. So we try to engage with charities and help ask them to provide more information about, uh, you know, either at the time of completion with reporting or when they're gathering donations. So tell us about the beneficiaries, the scope of the project and so on. Um, so that's how we help uh, donors. In terms of charities, in the beginning, we faced resistance because charities we are very well established here and they gather a lot of donations. They're doing quite well for themselves. But we can help them attract younger segments of the population and also residents. And we found the charities were not really using uh, technology in an optimal way. Very, very few had functional apps. Uh, I could count them on one hand or less. And some of them didn't even have payment platforms. So it redirect to the website. The websites, the UI, the UX, they were not very easy to navigate. And as I said, completely in Arabic, where we have a population of you know three quarters or more uh, are non-Kuwaiti. So at Give, we can help with that. Um, the other thing is we want charities, we want to help them communicate um, their needs and their goals, but also communicate the results and the impact. So we're, we're constantly on their case, reminding them of that. Um, so I think that's the, the what and the how. Uh, the why, you, you mentioned it perfectly in the intro. Um, so it, it really, this, the story behind Give uh, was born out of personal frustration and curiosity. Um, so back in 2017, I was sitting at home watching TV and the whole room started to shake. Uh, and alhamdulillah, in Kuwait, we were fine. Uh, there wasn't much damage. But later on, I thought, you know, I wanted to help and donate people who were badly affected uh, in the epicenter. And it wasn't that easy for me to find the right information. And that struck me as very strange and very odd, it, especially in a tech savvy country like Kuwait, in our modern age where we can use our smartphones to buy anything from food to flowers and clothing. Um, it's easy to consume, uh, to buy, to get. Why isn't it easy to give? And this is the question that stuck with me, um, hence the name of, of the platform. So I enrolled in a bootcamp, entrepreneurial bootcamp. Um, I set up a nonprofit tech company. So we are a technology company and uh, started to build a team. Our team works remotely, I mean, uh, all over the world. Um, and then I started approaching the charities and it took about a year from creating the company to having our MVP, which was a very small launch with just a handful in 2019. Um, just just for, to let you know, the original idea wasn't just a donation platform. It was supposed to be a resource for all your giving needs. So you could give money, you could give your time, you could find out about volunteering opportunities. Uh, give clothes or furniture, um, give a second chance, which was to become an organ donor, because I've also struggled with finding a way to become an organ donor. Uh, their website was down. It was something as simple as that tech issue. But I had to focus and uh, we decided to focus on monetary donations and uh, charitable giving. That's great. And I love what you said about, uh, you know, if we're so successful at using technology, to get, then why can't we use that same technology to give? Um, and with that uh, sort of in mind, uh, how do you see the future role of innovation in philanthropy, um, especially across regions like the Middle East, which I'm sure you'll agree has, for the most part, been operating in a very a traditional uh, way vis-a-vis -vis its philanthropic sector uh, and also a fragmented uh, way, perhaps? I find this topic really fascinating, um, innovation in tech and philanthropy. But just to take a step back, I think innovation can be regarded in a variety of forms. You could have innovative thinking and creativity, and also you could have innovation which relates to the tools that you use in the technology. So just to briefly comment on creativity or, um, you know, part of our vision at Give is to change people's perceptions uh, when it comes to donating and incorporate it into our everyday lives. In, in this part of the world, um, donating 
is inextricably linked with a religious component. So we're more likely to give during Eid uh, or especially Ramadan, that's the top season. Um, but at Give, we believe that giving should be um, come from a place of gratitude and not obligation. And that means that we'd, we'd like to make donating fun if possible. And we can do this by introducing new features, uh, well, new to, to, to us anyway in our region, such as fundraising, um, gift donations, and there's still lack of awareness uh, with these features here. Um, for example, in Europe or the States, anytime anyone participates in a, a sporting event or a marathon, they will often, um, you know, do it for a cause. They would run for a cause and then get their circle involved in sponsoring them for that good cause. Uh, London marathon runners to date have generated, I think, up to 750 million pounds for charities, right? And, and it's a wonderful experience and it's very inclusive. So that's when it comes to creatively changing the way we think about donating. Um, the other thing is tools. And technology really offers us the, the ability to be uh, flexible and to respond rapidly to changes. Um, if we look, for example, to the, the, the invasion of Ukraine that you know, just happened, um, two teens from Harvard created a website in three days, three days to match Ukrainian refugees with uh, potential hosts in neighboring countries. And there was an outpouring of, of, of help online from people volunteering to um, translate the website. Um, the website's uh, Ukraine Take Shelter, right? And now there are even hosts in America and Canada and so on, but they created it in three days, right? There was a need, they did it. Um, the other technology that I think is really fascinating and has tremendous potential in this sector is blockchain. So blockchain is a technology that allows digital information to be distributed, but not copied, right? So it mitigates against fraud. It happens in real time. There's transparency because you see every transaction along, you know, let's say along the donation cycle in this case, right? And it also offers um, a chance to reduce costs and be more efficient because you remove the need for third party uh, financial services. And a really great concrete example of this is the World Food Program's Building Blocks system. So Building Blocks helps 1 million people in Jordan and in Bangladesh uh, to access multiple forms of assistance from different aid organizations. Um, so how do they do that? It, it used to be the case that if a refugee um, on the system, they would be told when to collect their assistance and at different locations while juggling, obviously, the correct documentation, the authentication forms, different forms for each charity and so on. Now with building blocks, what they've managed to do is that they can present their QR code or with the UNHCR, I think they even do it biometrically so they can scan your iris. And um, the refugee or the displaced person can very, uh, visit various outlets or even retailers and buy what they need when they need it. And then that is automatically connected to their online account. Uh, so there's a record of each transaction and it doesn't have to be that person. It used to be before one person per family. Now anyone in that family is linked to that one account. Um, so it's wonderful for the, the, the recipient of the aid, but also for the agencies. It's done tremendously uh, important work for helping optim optimization and coordination so that you're not duplicating efforts. You see where there's a need. Um, and then the World Food Program for its, uh, where building blocks is operational, they reported that their costs for bank fees and financial fees fell by 98% because they didn't need those intermediaries anymore for like most of the transactions. So it was uh, quicker and cheaper. So that's phenomenal. Sorry, I can go on about this for a while. Uh, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of other um, NGOs that I think are doing fantastic work. And each, each NGO is able to leverage their own know-how in a different way to solve a specific problem. 
So Charity Water is a classic example of this. They, 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 they saw that millions were being wasted on poorly maintained wells because traditionally uh, charities used to go out physically um, every now and then to monitor and check the wells. So it's, it was quite difficult because they're in rural areas and they were quite infrequent. So if a well stopped working, it just meant that people went back to drinking dirty water until the ne next maintenance uh, occurred. Um, so Charity Water developed their own sensors, which they placed in the wells, uh, which could monitor the flow in real time. So whenever a problem occurred, a technician could go and fix it. And then after that, they were able to upload information on Google Maps on their website. So donors could see where they're operational and they could see the communities that were being served. Um, another great one close to my heart is Techfugees. So it's a nonprofit that organizes hackathons, uh, competitions to find tech solutions for problems facing refugees. So they offered um, I think won a prize because they offered training for refugees to become AI trainers to make visual data AI ready. There's also a great example of a smartphone uh, game, which is open source and free. It doesn't require an internet connection and it helps teach refugee children how to read. Um, so those are just some some wonderful ways how technology can can really help in our sector. And all powerful uh, examples and um, as, uh, as, as an extension, I guess, of, of that previous question, in what ways do you believe that the youth of today will change than how philanthropy is practiced tomorrow? And as a philanthropreneur uh, yourself, what advice do you have to youth who wish to pursue a career in the social sector, uh, which can both support making a living, but also connect them more meaningfully to causes that they're particularly passionate about? Um, I think when approaching the question of, of youth and how they can change philanthropy, we can look at it in two ways. Because one thing that we can't ignore in our area is, let's say, high net worth donors or family firms. Um, and the other is also, let's say, individual donors. So in our area, as you're well aware, um, family firms are a huge source of philanthropic capital. So I read a, a, a statistic that the top 100 firms, family firms in the GCC uh, account for $7 billion uh, of annual spending on philanthropy. And it used to be the case that CSR initiatives um, and spending might have been done on a, in a relatively ad hoc way, or in some cases, it might have been to serve a marketing purpose and so on. And now there's more of an emphasis on strategic giving. And part of the reason for that could be that a new generation is uh, you know, on board and they, 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 they place a greater emphasis on impact driven uh, philanthropy and transparency. And also I think many companies now are required or encouraged to share their um, their social environmental impact, you know, the ESGs and so on. So that's there's a twofold reason for that maybe. Or um, in terms of individual donors and young donors, um, it's significant to note that millennials will represent 75% of the global workforce by 2025. And according to studies in the US, they are very generous. They, this generation gives more than gener Gen Xers and baby boomers in terms of uh, the percentage of that segment who donate. It was as high as 84, 85%. And it's quite significant considering that they have lower disposable incomes than the other generations. They might still have uh, debts to pay off. They might not have bought you know, their house or you know, other large purchases, but they are still very generous. And when it comes to younger than millennials as well, um, nowadays, I mean, th these generations grew up with smartphones. The digitization of the financial uh, and social spheres makes it easier to learn about causes, makes it easier to share causes, and makes it easier to donate. But we have to be conscious of, when I say we, I mean us in the NGOs, charities, and so on. We have to be conscious of how we communicate with them, um, we, it's, I mean, we're already, or they're already inundated with information. The, the messaging has to be simple, personal, 
shareable and it has to have an impact. If they're going to spend their money, they have to know that there's an impact. And there is also the sense of community amongst younger people uh, when it comes to causes that they support. Um, um, another brilliant example of young people being involved with um, charity and philanthropy is in January of this year. I don't know if you heard about the YouTuber in, in, in the UAE. So Abu Fella is a Kuwaiti based YouTuber. Yeah, exactly. He's brilliant. So and he raised $11 million for charity uh, by being uh, living in a glass box for 12 days and live streaming the event. OK, I've never seen a live stream or even, you know, hardly know what it is, but like he got some earned Guinness records for the highest most viewers for a charity event and live stream. Right. And the longest continuously broadcast live stream. So that's, you know, the youth can be engaged and be a force for good. Um, so that, that was, I think, uh, something uh, was the second part. What's my advice to youth? Yes, if you can just share some advice. I mean, you yourself have, of course, uh, demonstrated um, use of entrepreneurial uh, skills and passions towards uh, philanthropic uh, causes, but in this case, of course, developing infrastructure to help to boost other people's philanthropy. So what advice would you have to youth who want to pursue a similar path? Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to offer advice, but I can share some lessons I've learned along my very short journey so far with Give. Um, so it, it used to be, I mean, it's cliche, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. You only have one life to live. So my fear of failure and my perfectionism used to hold me back from a lot of things. Um, I had no background in startups, uh, in technology. I had very little work experience. I was in and out of work frequently as I was having my children and so on. And this project made me overcome my hesitancy because I changed my mindset. And um, I started looking at it at a, as a, in a different way. I was engaged and challenged and found it exciting. And I was, my curiosity was sparked about how to build something from scratch. And that's what I focused on, how to build something instead of being fearful of it failing, you know? Um, and I had to accept that everyone starts from step one and it's okay to learn new things no matter what stage of life you're in. You know, I was in class with much younger people uh, and, and, we, and, and it's, it's everyone has to learn as, as, and you learn from experience, but also you can educate yourselves. Um, and I think the change, the reason for that change in mindset uh, was, first of all, had to do with being in the startup community. They're very, they're, it's, it's a very supportive community, first off. And then in the startup community, there isn't this um, as big a stigma attached to failure as there is in traditional businesses. So especially in a small country where everyone knows everyone else, um, you know, failure to, to the individual can feel like a stain on their reputation, right? Um, but failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success because through that, you start to gain experience. I mean, I remember people with me in the startup community joking about how their first startups failed and they were joking about it, you know? Whereas I would have thought, you know, People don't talk about this. And hearing that VCs would not invest in, in, in a startup unless the founder had other startups, whether they'd succeeded or not. Um, so that really switched the way I, I started uh, viewing things. Um, the second reason was being involved in this sector. So like NGOs and charities, you have to, I mean, ego is removed from the equation. It's not about me. It's about something bigger than me. Um, so, for example, many years ago, I would never have gotten in front of a room and pitched an idea, right, as I had to do for the charities multiple times. I probably would not have accepted this interview because I'm fearful of being on camera. Uh, I hope I'm doing okay. Um, so that's, that's something I've, I've learned. Um, in terms of young people pursuing social entrepreneurship, uh, and if they can earn a decent living from it and so on. I, I think there's perhaps a false dichotomy out there that 
you know, there's either this absolutist model, capitalist model, where you try to make as much money as possible, um, and it doesn't matter what the economic or environmental costs are. And on the other hand, you try to save the world, but you end up penniless, right? There is a middle ground. There's social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship tries to address some, some of the most difficult and pressing problems of our time. And you can earn a decent living from it because the goods or the services uh, that you create are in demand, you know? Um, and especially nowadays with the rapid changes in um, biotech, infotech, AI, robotics, the stable jobs might become obsolete, right? So we still need critical thinking, problem solving, creativity. There's always a need for that. Um, I mean, it's especially pertinent in our part of the world where 60% uh, of the population uh, is under 25 years old and the rates of youth unemployment in our region have consistently, consistently been higher than the global average. So it's something like 23% youth employment, unemployment in our world 14% for the rest of the world. Um, and also the, the, the elephant in the room, um, the pandemic has really changed. Uh, I think how we, how we look at things, I think it's made us take stock of our lives and it's really emphasized our interconnectedness. Um, we need purpose in our lives. So whether we can find that in our personal life or in our professional sphere, wherever you find it, we need that thing that will feed your soul. And working in the social sector is one possible way to find it. It's, it's, it's not the only way, but personally, I mean, I found a great amount of fulfillment in what I do. Really beautifully and authentically said. Um, thank you again, dear Shema, for your time and energy in sharing your story and perspectives uh, with us today. And I, for one, greatly look forward to seeing GIVE and your other ventures continue to scale and help accelerate the positive changes that we've just discussed for the benefit of many. Um, congratulations once again, and thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure.